Sorry for that uh, brief interruption of a phone call. I'm going to continue the lecture now. I'm going to be looking at sort of literature comprehension. This is really more, a little bit more about reading, uh, how you look at it, especially during your survey process. So comprehension is the process of reading and understanding the research found in the survey. So now I presume you've done your scan, you've browsed, you found a bunch of papers. Now it's time to really sit down and read those that are worth reading. So you're going to do your creative, uh, sorry, critical and creative reads. Um, We'll talk a little bit about uh, how do you do that a little bit better in terms of really understanding what's going on. So the first thing you want to do is divide them into piles based on subtopics within your research. As you've been doing your survey, and especially if you're doing a survey paper, you want to be able to collect things in some comprehensible manner, some taxonomy, organization. What the answer to that is, well, that'll depend on your theme and how you're putting stuff together, how you view them, and that's part of your, your first goal. If you've done a good scan, uh, and you have a couple of sentences, you can now start organizing those based on those sentences into things that seem to make related topics. Because then when you read them, you're going to be trying to look for things to uh, find similar among those that are related and ways of differentiating those that you somehow think are different. And don't be worried if, as you're doing that process, the piles keep changing. That's okay. It's part of the natural process of you figuring out how to organize your thoughts and how to organize the areas. Um, don't be freaked out if after reading the first five papers, some people freak out five, some at ten, whatever. Um, you're going to be delu deluged with new terminology, models, and approaches. Um, the most important thing is to hang in there. Don't get overwhelmed. Just read them. Take notes uh, for all the new terms, models, and approaches. And you can do that in your notebook like Leonardo did. Um, but don't get overwhelmed by it all. The more papers you read, the less new terms you'll be accounting, the more of an expert you'll be becoming. And that's just natural. So you're going to keep adding words to your keyword search list. You're also going to be adding words that you need to go look up. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some dictionaries later, but it is important that you have to know enough about the, the terminology to be able to read them. So how do you get started? Well, you read them the first time, and the words you don't know, highlight them, underline them. Uh, you can look them up, but you also want to be careful not to get too far off. Uh, very often, even if you looked up the word, you're not going to find a great definition for your subfield's use of that word. So sometimes you just sort of put the word down, then as you read the paper, see if you can define it based on its context and the way it's used in the paper. Uh, the first 10 papers, for most people, really are the worst. Once you're over that, you'll find the rest get much easier. And after you've done 100, which you should be able to do this semester, you probably will need to think about the process. It'll just become second nature as you go to do this. You might also find it very useful to write down in your notebook any nice phrases used in the papers. You're going to be writing, and so to be able to find what phrases you liked and why, uh, and maybe even be able to reuse them or quote them, because that's a common thing to do in a paper is to quote things. So the phrases could be things where you just like the way they're said, um, but it could they also be phrases that are related to what's the impact that has in terms of the field or something that either supports uh, your point of view as you're trying to, to connect papers or something that shows where the state of the art is or the limitations of the state of the art, so then you could use it. Um, note any interesting approaches to the experiments. How did they do them? Uh, this is especially important because you're going to have to eventually design your own experiments as a PhD student. So think about how they designed the experiment. What's, what was good about it? What was weak about it if there were things in the critical analysis? And then any nice displays of the results. It's also going to be something you're going to have to do. So in this, phrase, in this part of the thing, it's not quite just doing a literature survey. These last couple of things wouldn't necessarily be critical for a survey, but they are critical for your learning as a, a computer science PhD student. And you'd be surprised. Uh, some of those could be useful in the survey paper. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help from your supervisor or other people. Um, there are various forums that you can join where people will talk about a paper. Obviously, there's the discussion forum for this class where you're free to, to do that. Um, make sure you f uh, ask the author if you are confused. If you read something, most papers have the author's email, contact them. Uh, very often you may struggle. The first author of a paper is probably the student who did the work, and they may no longer be there, so their email may bounce back. Um, so at that point, you want to go for the last author, uh, who tends to be the faculty member who tends to stay in the same place longer. Um, you should also look for the authors on ResearchGate, a uh, tool I showed you last week, um, because in there there's often ways to directly contact the author, and some authors keep that up to date as they move from school to school. Um, there's two reasons it's really important to ask the author. First, they're by far the best person to interpret what was supposed to be happening in the paper, uh, so they are the, in a, generally in a good position to help you. Secondly, by asking the author a question, you may be helping the author 
because the author might not have recognized how confusing something is when they wrote it. And as professional writers, they need to get better as well. So the more they understand what their audience did not understand, the next time they write a paper, they may do a better job. So don't view it as bothering the author. Viewing it as helping the author. Because if you didn't understand it, chances are good somebody else didn't understand it because the author could have worked a little better at making it uh, in the presentation to make it more uh, understandable for people. So don't view it as bothering them. View it as you're helping them as they help you. The process of reading uh, and trying to understand complex research can sometimes be a discouraging one, but be systematic about it uh, in terms of how you're going to tackling it. Um, and systematic approach is really the best. And keep at it. Right? You may feel, oh, this is just overwhelming. You, you know, heard me talking about how many papers I read per week. Well, I've been doing this for 30 years, so it's you know I'm pretty good at it. You will get better at it if you've done the, the this week's scan or as you do this week's scan. You're going to time yourself. You will get better at it. The students who've taken this class before do, when um, they find these these techniques helpful. And oddly enough, forcing yourself to stay on time will actually make you uh, better at that part of the process. When it comes to the comprehension piece, there is no limit to the time you can spend trying to understand a paper, uh, but you want to limit it anyhow, even though you could spend more time because you have to balance how deep you go in one paper and how much you go on to the next. Part of the process that you have to do might require a simple replica of an experiment describing the research to really understand it. I mean, at a certain level, you don't really know what something is until you've done it yourself, uh, or you might not, in which case, that's okay. Um, that simulating and prototyping software is you know, pretty easy. As I mentioned before, um, you might try and find the code from the authors. That's not quite the same as writing the code, but it'll give you a pretty good understanding. You want to balance your time, however, because rerunning somebody's else's experiments and getting deep into it is sometimes, for some people, a, a nice outlet because it's a nice diversion from reading through all these other papers you didn't understand. And so you just jump off in the weeds getting, getting coding done. You have to decide, is that really the right time to do it uh, and the, le the amount of time you're going to spend on it? On the other hand, having good software skills is an important skill, so there's a balance to be done there. But when you're doing a survey, implementing stuff isn't always that critical. Sometimes when you're trying to, you're deeper into your own research, implementing it is worthwhile because if you've decided that this is going to be the benchmark in which you're going to compare, then you're going to need a version of it anyhow, and that'll help you understand it. So uh, during this reading process, it's sort of uh, the, the deep read, which is the sort of, uh, creative side uh, or the critical or, or some combination. It's very important when you deep read this paper in an active manner. You don't just skim the material as you did in the first pass, and because I've tried to teach this multipath method, sometimes it's easy to sort of skim over it. But at a certain point, you have to stop skimming and start really deeply reading because you want to understand it at this level now. Um, in your survey paper, you could actually still have some papers that you haven't done a really deep read on because they were cited by other people, you relate to them, and you might do something that's somewhere in between a scan, which is simply too shallow, uh, but you might be doing a half an hour read instead of a half, you know, half a day read or three hour read, depending on how deep you need to go to really understand stuff. Um, when you're beginning, especially if English is not your, your first language, it might be necessary to reread a sentence, one phrase at a time, one word at a time, until the meaning is evident to you. Uh, if you are like me and you have some issues with reading, you might find it beneficial to have the paper read aloud to you, especially, if, again, if English is not your native language, and if listening is easier than reading, or at the same time, if you want to practice your English. Um, things like uh, Adobe Reader have a, a mode for having it read your papers aloud. It generally really butchers math and stuff, but it'll do okay at lots of papers. And if you need some help to do that, uh, send me mail. I can talk to you offline about how to do that. Um, you will find that drawing figures will help you connect things if you're drawing figures that talk about the different relations. Uh, being able to sort of diagram how the system works or what are the key components will really help you connect and remember material. So I strongly recommend this, especially if you're a visual learner uh, and, and figures will help you connect things much better. It may be the case you'll have to consult with some references to confirm the meaning of terminology, uh, this being the case, um, and that's fine. Uh, but I want to caution you not to, to run too quickly down the, the, the rabbit hole. I'll come back to the lexicon in just a second. If you really want to check how well you've understood a paper after a day or so, without looking back at the paper, try to summarize the key points and then go back and check the paper to verify. Uh, this has two things. First, by checking your memory, you actually improve your memory. Uh, and you'll get a feel for how well you're actually remembering stuff. And secondly, since you go back and check it in the paper, even if you got it wrong and couldn't remember it, you will get a refresher. 
but it's really important to try and summarize it without looking back because that improves your retention in the long run and it'll help you find the connections. Uh, it's also sometimes useful as you're doing that to think about what you remembered and why and what you failed to remember and why because then the next time you might change your process and sort of how to do that. So as I mentioned, as you're, as you're reading, um, you want to make uh, notes of your, uh, the important works uh, and the relationships. Um, and as you're reading stuff, the important elements, um, highlighting something or, or copying to your reader journal is even better with a citation. So you say, these are things you're doing. Um, if there are words that are confusing to you, look them up. I'll come back to, to, to this. But lots of things are, are difficult to understand because we're a highly technical field. And we may use a word in a way that is not the traditional meaning. So just looking up a regular dictionary will probably not always work. Um, one way of answering that question, if you, if you don't think it's well described in, in a paper, is to go back to Google Scholar, uh, put the phrase you're looking for in quotes, and then look for some papers. Um, this can sometimes be important because not all papers get the terms right, or sometimes they don't even bother to define them because they think you already know them. Uh, but if you look around, you'll find them. Uh, in fact, you might even try searching Google Scholar with the phrase you're looking for in quotes and then ask for definition. Um, as a secondary word, because you'll find a paper that has the word definition in it, at least maybe it'll connect them for you. Um, this last thing I want to talk about is sort of this idea of what, what are sometimes called literature maps, which in my view are a variation of what's called mind mapping. Um, and it's really to put some structure on the literature um, that connects the papers. You're really still going to write the title of your research and the main topics relative to research, and then find a way to organize them. Uh, you can do this on just regular paper. Uh, you can do it with uh, sticky notes, which is sometimes a useful technique, uh, which is what we used before we had uh, these advanced tools. Um, and now there's a uh, tool, something like uh, text2mindmap.com, can really make it pretty quickly and allow you to put them together. Uh, it's not something I personally do a lot because I sort of visualize them and connect them in my head, and I haven't had a lot of uh, need to draw them out uh, and much anymore. But when I was starting in this field, trying to, to do my first couple of survey-related papers, um, this was something that we did. In some of my uh, early PhD students, we had five or six pages of these things to figure out how to connect them. And one of the reasons for doing that is so that you can uh, make a more comprehensible story because you want to have collections of them. So uh, here's a, uh, a mind map, which is really just the connected papers. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you some more advanced versions in just a second, where you sort of have this paper on uncertainty in location aware systems is related to this paper, which is a little bit older, or that's the topic, sorry is related to location awareness, which is some, some older papers, which are then to ideas of what you want to look at. So they're not all papers. So here we go from location awareness to the need to study the, the appropriate information granularity, uh, implicit uh, and explicit interactions between the systems and whatever. Uh, and then you can have techniques and constraints um, related to the ubiquitous. And these things where, where there's uh, these topics that aren't lists of papers provide sort of categories that you might use to collect stuff. Um, I actually think it's good to try, and one of the nice things about using the tools or the sticky note approach is that you might rearrange these multiple times to sort of put the ideas together. So uh, here's actually one. You can uh, find this systematic uh, laboratory for imaging modeling's model of uh, how to deal with compressive sensing. And this one's nicely color-coded. So there's actually all these things related to uh, full wavefront interactions, other techniques related to optimization, compressive sensing. I would, and again, you can do this in lots of different ways, and tools can help you. Uh, this particular tool allowed them to actually connect them to the papers, which are linked to the bottom, and then the MATLAB code, if there's code for them. Keeping this stuff sort of together allows you to build this. But then when you're going to write your survey, you can sort of talk about all these things that are related to one topic or another. Uh, here's an, another one you'll find, which is sort of a, a breakdown of machine learning and algorithms, where you break them into categories of what's Bayesian, and then there's a bunch of algorithms underneath it. When you're writing a, a, the survey, this allows you to talk about things as large categories of all the work related to Bayesian, all the work related to dimensionality reduction, and connect logical concepts. But they're not the only way they could be connected. This is just one particular taxonomy. Um, but this idea of building literature maps or related to mind maps might help you organize your thoughts as you're going through lots and lots of papers. Um, and so it's something that you might want to do in the beginning. Uh, just some references. This lecture was include materials from multiple other uh, sources.